Welcome back to QFIT's View. This video will talk about velocity mapping and Voronoi tessellation. One of the most powerful analytical tools for data cubes is to map the velocity of the gas emission lines across the field. This can be done by fitting a Gaussian curve at every spaxel. This can be a multi-step process requiring preparation before and after the fitting to produce a coherent map. I have prepared a data cube from MUSE which concentrates on the O3 emission line of NGC 5728. I have trimmed the original data both spatially and over wavelength to improve the processing speed. As you can see, we have the O3 emission line is very strong here, especially in the center. To get the estimated wavelength and full width half maps from them, which is required for velocity mapping, I save the spectrum of a spec cell, right click, copy spectrum to new buffer, near the center. And then I do a standard Gaussian fit that I've described in other videos. So we can see that the center is at about 50, 58 angstroms and the full width half maximum is about six angstroms. I then go back to the cube data. And then through IMRED analysis velocity map, I put in my estimated central wavelength, which in this case was 5058, and my full width half maximum, which is about 6. And I'll leave the flux threshold at about 1% of the maximum value. That means it won't fit a Gaussian where the flux is less than 1% of the maximum. And as you can see, it goes through the process with the velocity map at each row and now it is finished. After the function finishes we are left with a nine layer data cube which represents the fitted components at each spaxel. The first layer is the continuum, the second layer is the height the third is the wavelength and the fourth is the full width half maximum of the fitted Gaussian. The fifth to eighth layers are the respective errors of the first to four layers and the ninth is the goodness of fit. If we have a look at each layer we can see that there are values which make no sense. For instance, the continuum has negative values. This is a nonsense. This is because the fitting process failed at these points. If I set the lowest level of the continuum, then it looks much more sensible. I've got this on logarithmic stretch. We need to clean up these maps to remove values that aren't sensible. And I have created functions on my GitHub library to do this. I've discussed this in a previous video. Also see the video notes, which will give a link. I'm going to use my function velmapfix, which defines ranges of sensible values for each of the four main parameters and sets spaxels outside those ranges to null. This is buffer three, so I will say buffer four equals velmap fix from buffer three. And now the continuum sensible range is naught to 3400. The height sensible range is naught to 100,000, which is one e to the five. The wavelength sensible range is 5047 to 5059 angstroms, and the full width half maximum range is 0 to 16. I had previously explored this data cube to check on this sensible range. Let's press enter. As you can see, the map scans every pixel and sets where there is a problem. After the function finishes, we can have a look at the layers now. I'll change the color map to rainbow so that we can see it a bit more clearly. So on the first layer, and I'll make that of a logarithmic stretch, we can see the spiral circular structure of the nucleus in the continuum. On layer two, we can see the spectacular outflows in the excited oxygen three light. The wavelength map, which I'll make linear in this case, shows the outflows combined with the rotation. 
and the dispersion map shows a bar of high values in the middle. And these are from the overlap of the two outflows plus the beam smearing. As an adjunct to this, I have created a function to make an extended velocity map cube to add in calculations of flux, velocity, velocity dispersion, equivalent width, and dispersion versus velocity ratio. This is available on my GitHub. It's called VelMap Standard to Extended. Again, see the link in the notes. For this sort of analysis, we might need to improve the signal to noise for the low levels of emission. We can do this through a process called Voronoi tessellation. This is a method of aggregating pixels to increase the signal to noise on an image. For this, we need both a signal and a noise image. I have an example for the center of NGC 5728, where I have the signal plus the noise map from the Muse data reduction. I'll open up the signal map, which I've just called Voronoi signal. And as we have a look, we have a logarithmic stretch there, and then you can see the spiral internal structure. Plus I have a noise map. I get the signal to noise map by just dividing these. So I can say buffer 6 equals buffer 4 divided by buffer 5. And as you can see, the signal to noise in the center varies from a value of about 70 and it goes down to a value of about 4. You tessellate the image by the menu IMRED, Voronoi tessellation. And we set the signal map, which was buffer 4, and the noise map, which was buffer 5. And then we set the target signal to noise. We'll set this to about 100, which was about the top value. And then we'll apply it to an image. We're going to apply it back to buffer 4. And we'll store the result in a new buffer. We just press the OK button. I'll skip over some of the processing as it takes a while. We can view the tessellation more easily if I set the color map of this result to rainbow and we do a logarithmic stretch. As you can see, the regions in the center are only about one pixel size, as you can see by the changing values but they get larger and larger in area as you go towards the region where the signal to noise has gone down. We applied the resulting tessellation to the original signal image, but that could also have easily been applied to the data cube. And then you do the velocity mapping after that to get better signal to noise in the peripheries. That's all for this video. Check out other videos on our YouTube channel.